to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. Here we explore the training and development of America's leaders in the application of air power and the profession of arms. The views expressed are those of the hosts and do not reflect the official policy or position of the United States Air Force, Department of Defense, or the U.S. government. The mention of companies by name is solely for the purpose of discussion and should not be implied as endorsement. Welcome back to Commission Ed, the Air Force Officer Podcast. I am Colin Slade. And I'm Reed Gann, and we're your host for Commission Ed. So Reed, two weeks ago, we introduced the idea of a commander. What is a commander? We talked through where they are in the Air Force, what they stand for, what are some of the unwritten rules or lesser known things about what a commander truly is. And we hinted at the time about the process of getting selected for command. And so I think that's the conversation that we need to have today is what is the no kidding process, both written and unwritten for how to get selected as a commander. Now, so you kick this off, full confession to you, Reed, to everybody in the audience. I actually don't know this stuff. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, I'm still a captain. Yes, I've been selected for major, but... I'm still, you know, a number of years removed from my first opportunity for squadron command. Yes, I can be a flight commander. In fact, I am one right now. But that is a very different, I guess, quote, selection than what we're going to describe here today for squadron command, as well as, you know, group wing on up, right? Yeah. So there's that. And then the other thing, I've made no secret of this either. I'm not sure if I want to be a commander. I may not have the ability to even become one, and maybe we'll get into some of that, you know, specific to my situation in today's discussion. But for these reasons, I'm ignorant to the actual no kidding process for selection. And so I'm going to rely very heavily on you, Reed, who are far more close both in time and geography proximity to command to help me and our audience understand how all of this works. Yeah, sure. Happy to. And something else, Colin, before we turn on the mics, and as we prepared for this, we did our fair share of Googling, right? Yep. This stuff is hard to find out. It is not secret. But but it sure feels like it. <laughs> yeah. So I do have some good contacts that were able to help clarify this process. I've had people in the past walk me through how this process works. It's not too dissimilar from other selection processes. So for, you know, any special program or even for promotion, there's a lot of similarities okay. to that process and to... And the, you're talking like a review board, submit your records, those kinds of things, which we've yeah. covered in the past. Yeah. So uh, we'll just talk about the differences and we'll go through the whole thing. But also to begin, we're going to really focus on squadron command because I'll tell you, once you get, you know, group and wing the politics that start getting involved there, no idea. And that is an even bigger mystery. So that's top secret level stuff. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it genuinely is right. We're not actually sharing secrets, but the point is it becomes a whole lot more dependent on timing and who knows who even more so than the squadron command does. The number of slots is a whole lot smaller. Mm -hmm. It gets a lot more complicated. And honestly, Colin, you know what, 5%? of every officer ever maybe has an opportunity to serve as a group and wing commander. I mean, it's a small number. So you're saying that the people that are listening to this podcast, few of them are going to get selected. Potentially. Yeah. For group and wing command. Yeah. And so maybe if you or I get there or we know somebody who does, we will ask them. But uh, <laughs> we're going to focus on squadron command. That's the one that the Air Force tells us is the best job in the Air Force, right? Mm -hmm. Squadron Command, that's the one everyone kind of sets on their career roadmap as the thing to do. So that's what we're going to talk about. Yeah, and that's actually not wrong either because the squadron is where operations take place, right? That That's where the Air Force exists. Yeah. I mean, if you think about the way that the Air Force is organized, there's really no relationship between you know, between an airman in the security forces squadron and an airman in the maintenance squadron. 
they may know each other, but like on the day to day, they don't really interact. Who do they interact with? The people in their squadron, right? Yeah. Especially the people in their, their element in their flight first, then the broader squadron. Now squadron commanders and DOs may interact across organizations, but down at the lower levels where the rubber really hits the road, there's going to be very little crosstalk, very little interaction between squadrons at that level. Yeah. And it is the squadron that does operations, as you mentioned. So that's the beating heart of the Air Force. So that's what we're focusing on. All right. Okay. So first and foremost, there is like a level of time in service, time in grade requirement to be eligible to be a commander. And that depends on the career field. Okay. So for security forces, very often they will be commanders as O4s. They will be on G-Series orders as an O4 commanding a squadron. Okay. But they will have had to have sewn on Major first, have worn it for some amount of time. It's not like they could be me, a Major Select, competing and being selected for command. And then as soon as I sew it on, then I instantly become a commander? Is that yes, no? I'm not sure. I do know personally a Major Security Forces in my OTS class who is a commander right now. And PCS there this summer after being wearing major for just a few months. Okay. So it can come up quick. It can. And I've also seen people on the candidate list, and we'll talk about that, who had a line number for. So okay. the bottom line is depending on your career field and the level of rank that they expect you to have, that's kind of where it starts. So I'm an 04 and for Intel, they expect O5s to be squadron commanders. That's generally the rule across the Air Force. You know, that's more often than not. All right. So I'm not really eligible. And AFPC is going to tell you when you are. They're going to send you out a message, whether it's via email or, you know, some sort of notification. And you, as the member, have to basically apply. Okay. So if you don't want to be a commander, don't apply. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Depending on the year, it, it changes, right? Sometimes you have to put in a statement of intent, and that means I do intend to apply for command, Okay. fill out the paperwork, have your senior rater sign it, that kind of thing. Or it's, I do not intend to apply for command. Same process, right? You're going to have to like sign something, and but you can't just like not do anything, at least if there's a statement of intent. So and the other thing that to consider there is also, it may not be that you don't want to be a commander ever. It might be that it's just not the right time in your career, maybe for your family developmental situation, maybe you just don't feel ready for command, but you may feel ready for command later on, and then you can apply for it at another time. Yeah. So the officer does get to have some say in the timing of it a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, for example, say you're at school, say you're at school and you're going to be at school for that year. You don't want to apply for command while you're at school. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. So, and I'm not sure if this has moved to my vector. That is a question mark I have. I know a lot of things have moved into my vector before, like trying to be a DO, applying for school. All those things have like moved into that tool. So it wouldn't surprise me if command had. It just hasn't come up for me, so I'm not sure. Right. But essentially, you have to signal that you intend to apply for command. Well, what are they going to look at? Your records. All right. No secret. This is, <laughs> you know, you've heard this story before. Yeah. So, but who is it that's going to look at your records? Well, at a given time, a development team from your career field is going to meet and they are going to review records. Okay. So these DTs, as they're called, at least in my career field, they meet twice a year. I, I think that's pretty consistent across the Air Force. Yeah, that's pretty standard. And Reed, I don't know that we've talked about DTs at any length. Yeah, no, this is good. So let's talk about DTs. Development teams are a group of O6s with a board president that is a general officer from your career field. Sometimes they will bring in others depending on what the DT is for. So I know for intelligence, they very often will bring in a token 17 from the cyber operations career field okay. because there's so much overlap in what we do and because intel officers can command certain cyber squadrons and certain cyber officers can command intelligence squadrons. Right. So they will bring those folks in in order to ensure that we're in sync and that, you know, we don't put a cyber officer in the wrong place 
you know, we want to make sure that there's the appropriate level of interaction. So these groups of 06s, and we're talking like basically wing commanders, maybe a very senior officer in that career field. Yeah, exactly. So they're wing commanders, they're air staff, you know, maybe vice wing commanders if the wing commander can't go. But yeah, they're very senior. You've got a general officer, usually one or two star, who is the board president. And their job is to make decisions for the career field. So they'll work promotions, they'll do school selections, they will do command selections, they will also start to vector you once you hit a major, you'll get a vector. And a vector literally is, sir or ma'am, here are my intentions for my career, here are my career goals. They will look at your records and they will say, this is where you should go next in your career field. You should do this type of job, you should go to this type of assignment. And then they will contact you. Hey, do you want to talk? Let's talk. I read your records. Here's where I think you are. Here's what I think you really need to do next. Does that align with your goals? That kind of thing. Yeah. So you say that vectors are done starting at 04. I've actually seen it in the CE career field for second lieutenants. Oh, wow. Okay. So they will actually start vectoring much earlier in some other career fields. And, you know, that vector is often just going to be vectored to stay in place. Okay. You know, continue to develop uh, where they are. But the point is, is that they're trying to introduce the officer to the idea of a vector early on and deliberate development of their career early on, right? Yeah, because these DTs are getting guidance from the most senior officers in their fields. What is our plan? What's our goal for the career field? Yeah. So here's a quick example of how that happened in the intelligence career field, and it was a pretty big shift, and it was in the right direction. For the longest time in the career path, the typical, quote-unquote, typical path of an intelligence officer, there was this thing called O4 leadership. And what that translated to was being a DO, maybe being the senior intel officer at a flying organization. But basically, those were the two things. And they were deemed so important that the DTs would pick what people would fill these assignments. Okay. Well, this became way too emphasized in the intelligence field, so much so that we were not choosing to go to school. We were not choosing to go to joint assignments. We were not choosing to go to other really important, like joint staffs or headquarters staffs or things like that in order to do these O4 leaderships because they were seen as a critical gateway to your development. Right. But we lost the bubble. We had gotten off track. And so guidance came down from headquarters. Hey, this is not in alignment with what the rest of the DOD and the rest of the Air Force wants. We need to adjust this idea of O4 leadership. And so we changed it. And so that's what a DT can do. They can vector, they can shape. They have real, a lot of influence in how a career field is developing and how it's working. That's interesting to think about how the developmental team, the DT, is not only for the development of the individual officer in providing that vector of how they're going to develop, but also the development of the career field itself. And, you know, we've talked about how this officer core is a club in that, you know, it's a professional club in that we get to determine who gets to come in. You know, we say what those requirements are, but then once you're in, we also get to determine how you continue to grow and develop. You know, we as officers decide all of these things together for our different career fields and across the Air Force to try and make us as good and as effective as possible. And as you've noted with your anecdote there, if we see that things are getting off track, we own this, we control it, and we can make those adjustments. Yeah, yeah, and I've seen it. I've been the subject. I was in the last group that was selected for DO through the old O4 leadership process. Mm -hmm. It was immediately after my DT where my selection was announced along with, you know, 150 other people or whatever that they were changing the process. I'm a big fan. I really think that we as Intel had gotten off track. Like why on earth would you choose to go be a DO of some small squadron that's not really doing an impactful mission instead of going to joint headquarters or going to joint staff or these other really important things that we need? So I'm a big fan. I think it was a good change. But yeah, I totally agree. All right. So these DTs, they meet every six months and every one of them will have a different selection of tasks that they have to do. And there's once a year they meet for selecting command. And 
the chief of staff and the SECAF will have published a memorandum of instructions. This memo has these things that we've talked about, right? Like these are the goals and priorities. These are the traits that are essential. If there's some initiative that we are trying to make sure the board is aware of, so officer, instructor, and recruiter, the OIRSD, yeah. that is an example of something that's going to appear in this memorandum of instructions. You will give consideration to people who have served in these types of positions, right? That's the perfect example of what's going to be in this memo. And they will then score records. They will rack and stack. They will make decisions about who they think should be in command. Now, there's only so many slots, right? Let's just use a nice round number of 25. Let's say there are 25 squadrons with commanders that are moving out in the next calendar year. It's always in the summer. So like June and July around Air Force installations is kind of a nightmare time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so real quick, Reed, I just want to clarify one thing. It's not that during the summer that the DT meets, they make the selection for commanders and then like make the announcement and immediately there's a whole bunch of changes of command. Yeah. It doesn't work that way. Yeah. Thanks. It, it kind so, of sounded <laughs> like that's how it works, but it doesn't. No, good clarification. Just to clarify. Yeah. The DT will meet during the summer, make the selection, make the announcement. And then there's a waiting period that prep a time for those selected commanders to prepare for the eventual change of command the following year. Yeah. So it's almost an entire year. As a matter of fact, just two or three weeks ago, my next squadron commander was announced and okay. they are arriving sometime next summer, 2022. Okay. Yes. So thanks for that clarification. All right. So the DT will list their candidates, the people who have applied one to N, and then they will draw a cut line based on the number of open billet, you know, command spots that are opening up. Yeah. Now they usually will do about a 1.5 to one, meaning if there's 25 spots, they're going to choose say 35 people okay. as candidates. Then they're going to also recommend a certain percentage of them as alternates. Okay. The DT you're saying selects some number over the available spots. Mm-hmm. Okay, so this is not them being selected for command. They're being selected as candidates for command. Yep. Then all of the DTs send their lists to AFPC. Okay. And AFPC collates and collects everything, and they create master candidate list. Okay. The reason for that is there are command spots that are outside your career field that must be filled. These include... ROTC, OTS. So there are all these spots all over the place that have to get filled. And so there needs to be like a master list. And what happens is once AFPC gets this list, this master list, then they send it out to wing and group commanders. These are called the hiring authorities. Depending on where you are, the level of command, echelon, all that stuff, it depends on who the hiring authority is. But then what they do at that level is they start calling people. Hey, who do you know? You know, I see this person. I think this person would be a great commander. What do you think? Hey, I don't know anybody on this list. Do you know anybody on this list? They start talking to their 06 buddies, you know, and they select who they want to hire. And they will often get it pretty narrow. They send it all up to AFPC. And then AFPC starts making assignments. Okay. Let's pause for a second, make sure, sure I understand, mm -hmm. you know, for the benefit of the audience as well. So the DT has sent all of these names to AFPC to create this master list. And that master list gets shared among all of the group and wing commanders who have vacancies that they're trying to fill uh -huh. with squadron commanders, right? And they're not necessarily doing a records review. They're probably looking at the records, but they're making phone calls using the brother and sister network to find out who these different people are in order to make their decision on who to hire. But you didn't mention anything about like interviews. Correct. So it's not going to be like a private business process where if you're hiring somebody for a very important job, 
like a director level type of position, you're not going to interview them. You're just going to review their paper records, their resume, essentially. And then you're going to call people who might know them to find out if you want to hire them. Yeah, I hear what you're saying. A couple things that make this a little bit different. One, the DT has, in a sense, already done this. The okay. DT. They've done the interview. They haven't done an interview, but it's almost inconceivable that, for example, every airman in some way or fashion is part of a larger organization. Right. And that person is going to be represented at the DT, almost certainly. So right now, I'm at the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. My wing commander is the DT person who goes and sits on the DT. Right. So when it is time for me to compete for school, this person knows who I am. And so they've already, in a sense, had that interview. Okay. Because they work with me. They know my commander. They park one row behind me. You know what I mean? Like there have been numerous opportunities for interaction. I've had a one-on-one -on -one with my wing commander. I will have more one-on-ones with my wing commander. So in a sense, all of those things that you are talking about, in theory, should have already happened. Because if you are on the candidate list, a DT of senior officers from your field, many of whom you will know, will have said, yes, this guy or gal would be a good commander. Okay, so when I'm making the decision and selecting from the list, I have faith that the DTs have done their due diligence and I have good people on the list. Yeah, okay. So here's why I bring this up. Because of how this works, as the process as you've described it, you do not get to represent yourself in the selection for command, for promotion, for school, for anything that really matters. You don't get to be there with the person who makes the decision and say, this is who I am. Rather, that is done by your records and the way that you interact with other people. And those people, you know, at higher and higher levels are going to be the ones who will then go vouch or not vouch for you. Yeah. And in that way, I actually like this process because anybody can shine for a 20 minute interview. Sure. It's a lot exactly. harder to hide your douchebaggery <laughs> over a 10 year career. Yeah. And that's really the point that I want to make that you need to have your record squared away because that's going to be the like the first cut, right? Yep. And then the second cut or the second gut check is going to be how does this person actually act on the day to day? Yeah. What kind of person are they when they're working with others? And those others are the ones who get to talk to the DT, talk to the group and the wing commanders who are making these selections about who you are. Yep. You don't. Yeah. So it's funny because there's been a lot of clamor lately for like some sort of 360 degree feedback, right? Right. Where you give feedback to the people above you and the people below you give feedback to you and this kind of, you know, circular idea of 360 feedback. In some way, it's kind of happening in this way. You have built a reputation. By the time your records go to the board, you are known. You are largely a known quantity. We'll talk about that in a little bit of some of these like unwritten rules, but by and large, and that's the thing again, right? If you look at this, the DT is composed of like wing commanders. Right. Who are then hiring. You know what I mean? So like they kind of already know who they want mm -hmm. because they were in the process of making the cut. Yeah. So they've already kind of eyed some people who make sense, who, you know, these people look like they would fit in my organization. It appears that their records are, you know, incredibly competitive. So-and-so spoke very highly of them. The timing looks right. Everything looks right. So then when the group commanders who are the hiring authorities or the wing commanders who are hiring authorities, they go back to their organizations with the list. Like, you know, hey, we talked about Jane over here. I think she'd be spectacular for this organization. What do you think? You know what I'm saying? So yeah. it's like a you almost pick your own kind of thing. Okay. I don't want to give the impression that I'm not for that process. I don't want people to think that it should be changed. I just want to make sure we all understand that. Yeah. Yeah. How it actually works. Mm -hmm. Your records, your interactions with other people, your character, your competence, your connection, mm -hmm. all three of them being represented there is how you get hired. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so that's essentially the process. So once the selections are announced, then the list goes out along with, and 
this is where my homework broke down a little bit. I don't remember if the candidate list goes public, kind of like, hey, you were at least on the list, you know, to kind of help inform you that you're doing well. Yeah, give you an idea where you were. Yeah. And alternates are also announced. And I have seen as late as three months before a change of command, for whatever reason, I don't know, the commander just said, hey, you know how we had so-and-so inbound? They are no longer inbound. It's now so-and-so. And that person was an alternate. Yeah. Circumstances can change. Yep. Stuff happens. Yeah. And that happens all over the place with, you know, special programs or school or all sorts of things. Right. Even making the alternate list is like, hey, uh, don't pack your bags yet. You know, you never know. So, yep. but that's really how it happens. And then the assignments come out. There's, you know, basically a memo. And every single person who knows their commander is leaving in a year, like instantly downloads the thing and like, hey, do you know this person? Do you know, do you know who these people <laughs> yeah, <right>. are? Yeah, <laughs> I, that's how it starts. Yeah. Because... They're going to be the person who establishes the culture at your organization for the next couple of years. So, yeah, it's kind of a big deal. Yeah. And we're not going to get into any major detail about this. As I understand it, and you two read, it's a similar thing in the Garden Reserve mm -hmm. that it's your records, it's who you know, it's a conversation among senior officers. That's how squadron commanders get selected in the reserve component, yeah. just the same as it is on active duty. Yeah. Now the timing might look differently. The rank requirements might look different, but ultimately the process itself is going to look very similar. Yeah. So, you know, truisms have good records. Don't be a jerk. There we go. <laughs> yeah. You know, don't <laughs> automatically eliminate yourself from eligibility by something that you've chosen to do. Okay. Well, let's get into some of the unwritten yeah. Eligibility. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, I keep saying, maybe I'm not eligible. Maybe I'm already past the point in my career where I can really make the decision. Yes, I want to be a commander and go chase after it. I actually don't know. Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit more of the nuance of selection and see, maybe not personally for me, though, I am interested in my own career development. We can make it a little bit more general. What are some of the unwritten rules the unknown eligibility requirements that are not going to be written down in any sort of AFI or memorandum or anything like that, mm -hmm. that people should be aware of if they're contemplating the idea of becoming a commander. Yeah. So first, of all, I'll start this by saying every career field is different, explicitly because their own DTs make the list. Right. So every career field will value different things, but there are general trends that are pretty easily to identify that, you know, you should be able to at least, you know, find where you are on this list of things in school, in residence for your IDE. That is like one of the biggest things that is incredibly consistent across the board. IDE. Intermediate Developmental Education. So it's the class, the school after Captain SOS right? It's as an 04, did you do school in residence? There are tons of different programs, but ACSC is the most common one in Montgomery at Maxwell Air Force Base. But in residence, PME at the appropriate level is a huge delineator. And why is that? It's competitive. So there's a selection process for that. Limited number of spots, the Air Force investing in you, taking you out of your career field to develop you as an officer. Okay. Yep. And because who will know you? Mm. Okay. Who else is going to school? The other 10%. Other commanders. Yep. Who is making the selection? Right? So okay. if I'm at ACSC, I'm also going to be there with people who are at Air War College. Oh, fives, right? Yep. So who is doing the selection for squadron command in two or three years? The same people I was at ACSC with but they were at Air War College, right? right? We might have run into each other at the BX. We might have gone to a, I don't know, a conference or whatever associated with being at school. So this is where like being known matters. We already talked about how being a known quantity is important. If you go to school, the top 10% know you. And who's making the selection? The top 10%. Okay, yeah. So... Also, even a little thing, even if you're going to a different school, say you're going to the Naval College or the Army or whatever, right? Your name 
was on a list and yeah. everyone got that list. So even at that level, you're like, oh, I've seen that name before. And we're all human beings, right? So these tiny little things, they matter. Yeah. The recency bias, the fact that you are, I don't know, Googleable is the right term. Discoverable. Yeah, discoverable. That's a much better way to say it, that you exist inside the Air Force in multiple areas so that you can be found and known. You have to be known yeah. in order for those recommendations and selections to be made. Yeah. The next one, you need to have fulfilled whatever your career field's level of like preparatory leadership. For Intel, that's a DO. You got to be a DO of a big squadron. For others, maybe it's deck commander or maybe in our acquisitions, it's some other sort of like program manager at the right level. Mm -hmm. But it's almost like the test drive for command. And so you need to, whatever your career field is, there's going to be some level of leadership or responsibility associated with that first level of FGO. And you need to do that and you need to do it well. Yeah. So like in the support world, you know, we don't do operations like you do Intel, you know, as a director of operations, but we still have like operations type functions for our career field. So there is the ops chief, which is almost invariably going to be an O4 in the CE squadron. There's the director of operations in a force support squadron. We talked about that a few weeks ago, that that is like the focal point of where things happen in the force support squadron. Same thing in logistics, security forces, you know, across the support career fields. And you mentioned the acquisitions, same idea. There will be a position of non G series leadership that officers fill that's going to identify them as someone who is competent and capable of being a leader within the career field, which then, as we mentioned, gets elevated into the DT. And that's where those conversations and selections are made. Yeah, exactly. So, Again, for Intel and other operations fields, it's DO. That's the one. That's the one you want to do. Others, we've already given some other options. But yeah, whatever that position is, you need to do that and you need to do it well. Got a quick question for you here. Yeah. And maybe this will get into some other unwritten rules. How important is it that that 04 leadership happens inside your career field? Super important. Crazy important. Because there are opportunities for you to go and do, you mentioned OIRSD, you know, go to a ROTC detachment, be an OTS instructor, which are types of leadership. Yeah. But they're outside the career field. Yeah. And actually one of my things, some one of these unwritten rules is spend as little time as possible outside your career field. Hmm. Because who is making the list? The DT who is in your career field. In your career field. Okay, come first circle. It makes sense. If you are not known, if people don't know you, all they have are paper records. Right. Which we all know are incomplete. They do not tell the whole picture of who Colin Slade is. They miss some things. Sometimes that can be scary, right? We're trying to get rid of some people who should not be commanders. And if all we have are paper records, that's scary. Yeah. Because that's how toxic leaders make it sometimes. Because they look so good on paper. Yep. And nobody can you know, vouch for them to say, yes, this is an upstanding individual. And so they have to go off of what's on the paper and then they mm -hmm. get selected and it's all downhill from there. No, yeah. That makes sense. So, yeah, that is something I've been told, you know, since the earliest days, Mike. If you're going to spend time outside your career field, you have to do it at the right time. It can't be too much. And, I have heard people who are trying for more senior positions say, I have spent too much time outside the career field. I am not going to make 06 or whatever because they don't have the experience that their DT feels is necessary to be a wing commander inside their career field, which is weird, right? Because general officers are general, general. officers. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So, <laughs> but I think that's a symptom of a much broader issue that we've talked about on this podcast before where... And this is, will get me into my next ones. I think we promote tactical competence. So for many career fields, to be a commander, you need to have done something as a CGO that set you apart in your trade. Like gotten a patch? Yep. You got to be a patch. You got to go to weapon school, be an instructor there, maybe be a DG, 
or maybe some other selective program, mm -hmm. you know, where your career field identifies this as special, as good, as competitive, as selective. If you do that thing, you are now on the track yeah. to being a commander. And in the ops world, that's weapon school. I mean, the other one is to be a pilot or a flyer. How many times, Colin, have you heard that called the universal commander badge? Yeah, I've heard that and I kind of, you know, cringe, but also... It's a pilot's air force. It's a pilot's air force. You know, can we fault them for it? No. I don't know. I'm actually at peace with that. I want people leading the air force who know something about air operations. Yeah. Just that's me. I don't know. I'm biased with airplanes and aircraft. Yeah, but at the same time, like we talked about two weeks ago, that a pilot can be the commander of a medical squadron, but not the other way around. I mean, do you really want a pilot leading the med group? More than I want a doctor leading the flying squadron, yes. <laughs> but yeah, I, I hear you. I hear you. The most senior intel officer for my first few years in the Air Force was a pilot. The A-2 at headquarters Air Force was a pilot. Yeah, and the Air Force didn't burn to the ground, so he must have done okay. Yeah. So there are things that will help. And, you know, if there are things that you can do at your level as CGOs especially to get into some sort of special program, some competitively selective something or other, you know, maybe getting a Ranger tab. If you're in more of our battlefield airmen, yeah. you know. Security forces, Crow, Stow, absolutely. Yeah, getting that sort of, hey, I competed, I was selected, and I did well, that says something, and that helps get you in that conversation. Real quick, that brings up the idea of joint. You know, going over and doing some other activities with the other services, such as Ranger School. We mentioned earlier, like a joint assignment as a senior CGO, as a new 04. How does jointness play into the selection for commander? I just hope it's not too long because, again, being outside the career field. Okay. Yep. So here's where we start getting lost as a service, right? Yeah, These are things that the chief of staff is like pounding the table. Like we got to emphasize these things. And so maybe in their memorandum of instructions, they will say we value joint time. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not known, but you've got good records and they're like, oh, they spent four years at a joint assignment and did well. Yeah. You know, so these are the things that the senior, senior, senior leadership is trying to do to try to influence things. But yeah, this is the devil of the details, right? You got to be known. You have to be a known quantity. Okay. A couple other things. You kind of need to have at some point performed well in a large peer group. Are you talking about strats? Yeah. So you have to have, you know, a top 10 strat. Is that what you're hitting at? No, because if you're number one of six your whole time, that's not a very big group. Mm, right. So at some point... You may want to get into a little bit bigger pool of folks to see if you really do rise to the top. Okay. What if you can't control that? That's fair. But these are all like, as I look at the list of commanders, the people that I'm like, man, I'd follow that person anywhere, mm -hmm. but they don't get selected for command. And then you ask where they've been and what they've done. They're like, oh, you've always been at these like tiny little weird like we have airmen there type places their yeah. whole career <laughs> and then they get told yeah no one knows you one because you're in a small group right yeah and two yeah you have good strats but they're not big good strats mm. you've never been at wing and gotten a top 10 percent. you've never been at a squadron of you know 300 or something you know and so recognizing this is all biased and influenced by my experience. Yeah. But yeah, I know a really good guy. He's a peer of mine and he's just always had these weird, tiny little detachment type jobs and they're trying to compete for a squadron command. And they're like, you're good, but are you like, you've always been the brightest light bulb, but there wasn't a big selection. So I don't, are you really a bright light bulb? And that's a rough thing to confront when you're, yeah. You know, at that point in your career. I mean, I get it. I understand you have to be known. This is really the theme that I'm catching across all of this is you have to be a known quantity to the Air Force, especially within your career field. But at the same time, I have to wonder, are these unwritten rules in this process 
creating officers who are chasing certain criteria, such as being located at large installations with big peer groups. And then within that area, trying to make sure that the person who gets to sit at the table as close as possible to the group and the wing commander so that they are a recognizable face and that their name is on everything, right? They're volunteering for every program, every extra duty so that they are known. Like, do you see how this might be producing unsavory behaviors that might then eventually lead to the toxic behavior that we often hear about in our squadron commanders? Yeah, unquestioningly. And the thing about everything you've said is it's known. And I do see some trends in people trying to overcome a lot of this stuff. When the DT is evaluating records, a significant amount of the data is masked. For example, higher education. Okay. Do you have your master's, right? That is a mass quantity until you are competing for 06. Okay. But people are still going to know whether or not you have a master's degree. Yes, they will. So, but at the same time, what I'm trying to point out is that they are trying to take steps to try and improve some of these things, but there are just facts that you can't overcome. You cannot forget that you know someone, right? You cannot forget their reputation. You can do all you can to be objective and say on paper, they look great, but you will be influenced by the things you know. That is human nature. So yes, but this brings up a quote from John Boyd. You can either choose to be somebody or do something. Yeah. And so if you want to be a commander, and there's nothing wrong with that, I've made it known that this is something I would like to be. I would like to have the opportunity to command. But I will not sacrifice my morals, my ethics, in order to make that happen. And I really do believe that if you are I know this sounds so corny, blooming where you're planted, doing the best job with what you've been dealt. <laughs> but this is all the, all the things we've always heard, right, Colin? Yeah. But if you're doing well, I think people can recognize that. But I have been told, you need to go to this meeting. Why? Go to this meeting. Understood, right? Like, mm -hmm. because that's also some of the facts. If you don't show up, maybe it will. I think you have to find that balance. You have to strike that balance of, trying to be known appropriately, trying to take appropriate credit, yeah, but also, you know, try not to lose yourself at the same time. Because some people do. Some people lose themselves. Right. So let's try and you know, bring this back to a positive. Let's end this on a high note. Read as best as you understand it. You know, we know that we've got young officers, people who haven't even commissioned yet, who are interested in one day being a commander. Let's say that they are the good ones that are not going to you know, sell themselves in order to make command because they want rank and power and authority and all those sorts of things. What are the unwritten rules, the steps that they must follow and take without selling their souls that's going to get them selected for command? Yeah. Consistent performance. That's a solid, right? Consistent okay. performance. You have to complete the appropriate level of PME on time. You will not make 05 if you have not done your IDE, whether that's in correspondence or in residence, right? Okay. You know, so like those are like thou shalt not pass <laughs> type things. You, you have to do that. If you perform consistently well, you accomplish the appropriate PME on time, and you don't do anything to get yourself a UIF or an LOR or an LOC or those types of things. Technically, you're in the running. Can I add one more? Sure. Show up. Be present. Yeah. Yeah. Be there in the squadron. Yeah. Yes, that is going to mean not just during the duty day, but the other things. Be there. Be present. And also across the wing. Get involved. Yeah. N not saying sell your soul to the CGOC or the other, you know, all the extra duty opportunities. but if the goal is to be known in your career field and by senior leaders at the group in the wing who make these decisions, that's where they are. So you better be there too. Yeah. And I think you can be known without selling yourself. I genuinely do. And I don't know, you know, the upbringing of our audience, you know, everyone comes from a different place. Right. 
but there was something associated with being a GAN that meant something to us, the kids of my parents, right? Yeah. And I think that we wanted to be known as good people. I think we wanted to be known as hardworking people. And I think that can apply to the situation. Who do you want to be known as? And maybe you don't. And maybe that you're listening to this and you're like, man, I, I don't even want to be thinking about this game. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Define that success for you. Right. You know, we talk about it all the time. But if you're okay with being recognized for what you do and having a reputation of integrity, of hard work, of good performance, you're in the running. And if you are working for the people around you, they are going to spread that message. You know how we talked about how when the group commanders and hiring authorities, when they get the list and they start calling around and asking about people? Yeah. What do you want your name to be known for? Yeah. What do you want that conversation to sound like? Do you want that young CGO who's like, oh, yeah, this guy, he was my flight commander when we were deployed. I would do anything for this person. They're amazing. Mm -hmm. You don't have to sell yourself. You just have to be you and do the best job that you can to be the best you that you can be. Yeah. Which is great advice for anything yeah. that you want to accomplish in the Air Force or outside of it. Yeah. So I think that this is a good process. It can be better, of course. Are we trying to make it better? Yes. Do we get some bad ones? Yes. But overwhelmingly, I think it's fair. I think it's thorough and it's competitive as crap. Are you kidding me? Like, this is hard. <laughs> yeah. I see a lot of people that I thought, man, I thought they'd be a really good commander and they just don't make the cut. Yeah. And there's all sorts of things we could talk about in that regard, right? Like the army's undergoing this really big, like mental evaluation for fitness mm -hmm. to be a commander. And, you know, maybe we'll do an interesting episode about that, but there's a lot that goes into this. And, but overwhelmingly, I think we're getting it right more often than we're not. Yeah. And then the takeaway from that is for those who end up working for these commanders, can have confidence that the officers involved have done their due diligence in making the right selection. Yes, some selections are going to be wrong. It's inevitable that eventually the Air Force is going to get it wrong. It happens. But maybe give them some benefit of the doubt. Yeah. That there were some senior officers who really honestly thought this person can and will succeed as a commander. And so maybe lend them your support Help them to succeed. Yeah. And it may be that it's just the wrong unit. You know, maybe they would be an excellent commander at a slightly different organization or mm. the organizational climate above them changed. You know, there's so much that goes into this. Right. I do think that honest, hardworking, patriotic Americans did their darndest to pick who would be best. And they are human, just like you and I. Yeah. But I think they get it right more often than they get it wrong. You know, Reed, I think that is the positive note that we were looking for. I think that is a good place to leave it. I don't have any heartburn over any of that. So I think I'm good. And I definitely feel much more informed, much less ignorant over the process. So thank you for doing the research and helping me and the rest of the audience to understand how all of this works. Have we left anything untouched? Is there anything more that we need to know? I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure this was largely informed. Again, I had a friend who has worked this process uh, more at the action officer level, kind of making everything happen, but it very, you know, centric on my career field. So I'm certain, especially for the other career fields, I'm probably got something wrong here, but this is the general structure. I'm certain we missed something. Please reach out, email, social media, let us know. We are more than happy to get on here and, you know, give a mea culpa if we get something wrong. Yeah, because we're both still learning. Yeah. Definitely me more than you, but you haven't been through the process yet. You had to ask some people for some help. So please, audience, if you know that we got something wrong or if you want to just clarify something, please send that our way and we'll be happy to make those corrections for everybody else. Yeah. Colin, I think that will do it. Everybody, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Commission Net.